proposal. Oh, come on. No. Pits that have no further mineable reserves that are workable or which can be beneficially developed. Yes. This is a contract. Yes. 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 Look, yes. we avoided using the words uneconomic or economic to help you. But this means exactly the same thing. Yeah. Beneficially is a broad gauge word designed to help both parties. We're not expecting every pit to be profitable, but we need to move towards better performance. We're interested in more than just the balance sheet, Mr. McGregor. We also want to protect our people. Oh, yeah. you are arguing about just one word. There's nothing wrong with the word sentence. It's the word death before it that's worrying. We are saying that there must be some means of codifying what the rules of the game are. We've gone as far as we can to help your position. We've also got to have something to show. Peter, yes? The talks have just broken down. They still can't agree on the wording for the third category of closures. What a relief. I understand from Nick Ridley that the docker strike is crumbling. Yes. Apparently the lorry drivers are becoming utterly fed up with being stranded at the ports. They've been making their feelings known to the docker's union officials. That's better news. We knew this wasn't going to be easy, Peter. It's the toughest challenge this government's faced. But tonight, Arthur Scargill must be wondering where he can turn to next. Arthur, I'm off. You should do the same. It's been a long week. No, not yet. Got to finish this speech for tomorrow's conference. Don't you ever get tired? How do you keep going? I can go on because I know we're right. I know we are right, Peter. And we're going to win. We do not need reminding of what took place in the 1960s when this union acquiesced to a policy of mass destruction of jobs, pits and mining communities. We vowed that never again would we stand by and witness such vandalism? Never again would we sit back and watch our people turned into industrial gypsies, wandering from coalfield to coalfield, from pit to pit, searching for work, victims of the narrow, balance sheet mentality of both coal board and government. Today, we are fighting for the right to work, for dignity and self-respect. Comrades, I salute you for your magnificent achievements and for your support. Together we cannot fail. The miners' shocking intimidations ought to summon from the nation the spirit which has recently vanquished another enemy. We had to fight an enemy without in the Falklands. We always have to be aware of the enemy within, which is more difficult to fight and more dangerous to liberty. The woman is clearly barking mad if she's comparing miners on strike in defense of their jobs with a fascist junta in Argentina. The lads on the picket lines have started wearing the enemy within t-shirts. Thanks very much, lads. We're going to win this. Those dirty scabs can go to hell. Uh, they say you can tell the difference between the pickets and the scabs by the sun tan. <laughs> Prime Minister, I do not think time is on our side. I'm not convinced that we've got more than six months coal stocks left. I realise this clashes somewhat with Peter Walker's figures. At times, I'm slightly wary of Peter's optimism. I think we need to consider as soon as possible measures to win the dispute by the autumn if necessary, by breaking the strike. A more aggressive strategy could be politically very dangerous. I see. Norman, I do share your concerns. During Ted's government, officials were constantly claiming that power supply could be maintained. And the lights went out. Yes, and the lights went out. We cannot allow that to happen again. This is strictly secret, so keep it to yourself. I've asked Peter Walker to join me in a meeting with Walter Marshall of the Electricity Generating Board. I've asked for a full presentation of their figures. If supplies of coal from Nottinghamshire and other working areas are maintained to our power stations at their present level, we can keep going for about 
12 months. In fact, if I can show you this chart, Prime Minister, you see June 85 is probably a conservative estimate. I think we can probably keep supply going until November 1985. Now, if coal production goes up, if more miners return to work, then we may be able to go on until spring 1986, even later. This is very reassuring. But these predictions are extremely sensitive to the supply from the Nottinghamshire pits. That's right. Small increases or decreases in production and supply could dramatically affect our endurance levels. Should we be considering importing coal for the power stations? I don't think so, Prime Minister. It might annoy the Nottinghamshire miners. If we lose their support, then we could be in serious trouble. A turbulent year for Mrs Thatcher's government reaches its climax tomorrow on the eve of Parliament's summer recess. The Prime Minister and Neil Kinnock will clash for the first time in a full-scale debate as Labour denounces the government's economic policies as a shambles. The Prime Minister has done all she can to make the strike political. Yeah. Yeah. She has invested her own credibility in the conflict. She has interfered to attempt to isolate the miners. She is prepared to spend any sum and create any chaos in the pursuit of a political victory. Some of her party understand the Right Honourable Lady's lack of understanding. They recognise her extremism. They recognise her obsessions, or as they put it, her absolutism. They want her to return to... Did you hear him on the radio? It's like listening to processed cheese coming out of a mincing machine. Nothing meaty, just one mass of meaningless rhetoric. It anaesthetizes the listener. <laughs> her motives, her policies, her judgment, her obsessions, her fixations are not trusted. She is not trusted. She says that she loves her country. For the sake of that country, she should go now. <laughs> The Prime Minister. The Labour Party is the party which supports every strike, no matter what its pretext, no matter how damaging. But above all, it is the Labour Party's support for the striking miners against the working miners which totally destroys all credibility for its claim to represent the true interests of working people in this country. The Right Honourable Gentleman leads a party which claims to support democracy but repudiates those miners who voted democratically to remain at work. Yeah, yeah. Mm. The forces to which the Right Honourable Gentleman has lent his voice and support have no more love for parliamentary democracy than for the jobs and homes of those who oppose them. Yeah, 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 yeah. There is only one word to describe the policy of the Right Honourable Gentleman when faced with threats whether from from home or abroad, and that is appeasement. We're all being sucked into Scargill's bloody mess. You were fine. How can I attack the government with one arm tied behind my back? No ballot? Appalling violence on the picket line? How can I fight the miners' corner with all that round my neck? Surely... Well, I'm not going to let the Labour movement become Scargill's scapegoat when his great project goes belly up. To date... 5,300 men have been arrested, 2,000 have been injured by the police, four have been killed, and so far we've incurred two million pounds worth of legal expenses. Every day more of the scabs are taking out legal actions against us, trying to declare the strike illegal. Yes, well, I'm papering the walls with the rips. We can't ignore these legal moves, Arthur. If we are found in contempt of court, our funds could be sequestrated and God knows we're already running out of money. We need more cash to keep the strike going. And much more support from other unions. We've got to ensure that they don't cross our picket lines. And no industry should accept supplies of coal or anything else delivered by scabs. The TUC must back us publicly. Look, right from the start, the easiest thing in the world would have been for us to have gone cap in hand to the TUC General Council. But we know where that would have ended up. They'd have taken over the negotiations and would have been stitched up. 
We can get what we want from the TUC if we appeal to the rank and file, if we take our case to the floor of the annual Congress. Congress, I am sad that the National Union of Mine Workers saw fit for so many months to ignore the General Council and the government of the trade union movement. That saddens me. But now they want our help. Now I accept that my union has to date refused support. That is because the NUM had not first gone to the TUC. But that has now changed. <laughs> Let the government know, and the unions, moderate or what you will, that the position is changed from today. And that my union and its 943,000 engineers are at one with the miners and will resolve this dispute on the basis of victory! It's just posturing. Strong on rhetoric, weak on action. The TUC haven't given Scargo anything concrete at all. Well, it looks worrying to me. They're not going to move coal, coke or oil substitute or use materials taken across NUM picket lines and they're not going to use oil that is substituted for coal. But look at the small print, Prime Minister. This support will only be implemented after detailed discussions with the General Council and agreement with the unions directly concerned. It's a fudge to keep the TUC united. I don't think they have any intention of giving that support. One union leader said that either this resolution means the end of civilised life as we know it, or it doesn't mean what it says, and it's a con trick on the miners. <laughs> <laughs> Prime Minister, talks between the Coal Board and the NUM are scheduled to begin again. I see. When? The 9th of September in Edinburgh. Why has McGregor shifted to this dubious concept of closing pits that cannot be beneficially developed? The board must not give away the basic principles that are the reason for us fighting this strike. Scargill's claim that uneconomic pits should never be closed must be defeated and must be seen to be defeated. I don't think McGregor fully appreciates Scargill's deviousness. That's because he's a businessman, not a politician. Arthur, we'll stay the execution of the five pits and put them back into the colliery review procedure. We'll phase the cut of four million tons of capacity over a longer period of time. But in exchange for that, we have to have some form of words, any form of words, which means that there's a third category of closure, which is neither safety or complete exhaustion of the coal reserves. Can't you understand that we have a responsibility to the miners we represent? <sighs> Gentlemen, it comes as a total package. You don't get the first two things unless we get the third. If we can agree it, then I'll give you some things you can use to go off and claim a great victory, provided we can still genuinely say that we have retained, at the end of the day, the right to manage the business. We don't need your condescension, Mr. McGregor. Our members can see for themselves whether or not they're being sold out. Okay, okay. We need to find another phrase to replace beneficially. Satisfactory or acceptable. So closures will take place where there are no further reserves that can be developed to provide an acceptable basis to the board for continuing operation. Come off it, that means exactly the same thing. Of course yeah. it does. I switched on the television to see Mr. McGregor walking into the talks with a bag over his head. Yes, I asked him about that. He said he was fed up with being pursued by the press, so he put a Harrods bag over his head. He told the press the meeting was so secret it wasn't actually happening. He wasn't really there. It was a joke. That man's a public relations disaster. Well, the talks are getting nowhere. <sighs> Good morning. Secretary of State. Morning, yes. Prime See the uh, when did this come through? A few minutes ago. The yeah. McGregor knows? Yes. Right. Shall we begin? Peter? Uh, sorry, Prime Minister. Bad news. The Pitt Deputies Union NACODs. Their executive has just voted to ballot their membership on strike action. Why? They feel their members are being badly treated by the board because they're being told to cross picket lines. I have to say the situation could have been handled with a little more sensitivity. 
McGregor announced on Newsnight that he's got plenty of men with the certificates to do the pit deputy's job. Oh. When's the ballot? Two and a half weeks' time, the end of September. NACOD is a fairly moderate union. Their new leader, Peter McNestry, is sympathetic to the NUM. I want to be absolutely clear. The pit deputies perform statutory safety duties. If they go on strike, the coal board is legally obliged to shut down every single pit. Unbelievable. They could do in three weeks what Scargill has failed to achieve in six months. Didn't McGregor see this coming? He's always insisted that the NACOD's leadership just made a lot of noise, that the unions had such a long history of not taking industrial action. There's no way they'd ever get the two-thirds majority required. Well, this is extremely serious. For one thing, it means that Scargill will have a much stronger hand in the negotiations. Yes? The General Secretary of the TUC is on the line. Thank you. Arthur, uh, the NACOD situation. If the membership vote for strike action, it will considerably strengthen your position. So everyone tells me. Well, you'd be crazy not to get involved in their talks. We don't necessarily want the same things. But you're in a much stronger position if the two unions work together. I hear what you're saying. Arthur. Ca sorry, can you... Hang on. Of course. What? The strike's been declared illegal. In the High Court case, the judge had been asked not only to declare the miners' strike illegal, but also to order a ballot. Mr Justice Nichols said a ruling on the ballot would have to await a full trial, possibly next month. Mr Scargill said this was the latest in a series of judicial moves against the working class. Will you change your tactics now the High Court has declared the strike illegal? I don't care what the High Court says. No judge is going to take away my right to call a strike. We do not accept the ruling. Simple as that. The strike is still official, and any miner who crosses the picket lines in defiance of union instructions will be liable for disciplinary procedures according to the NUM's rules. Yes? The result of the NACOD's ballot has come through. And? 82.5% have voted for strike action. That's bad. That's very bad. We could lose the entire dispute because of this. We've got four weeks before strike action begins. Where's McGregor? On his way. It's vital, absolutely vital, that the coal board is as conciliatory as possible towards NACODs. Yes? Mr. McGregor's waiting outside. Send him in. Ah, Mr. McGregor. I'm very concerned about the pit deputies. Uh, Prime Minister, even if they go on strike, it shouldn't worry us so long as we can keep Nottingham going. You mean you're prepared to let them strike? Yes. God, man, you're serious? We must not be seen to deviate from our aims. We cannot give away the right to manage. Yes, but letting them strike is just tactically inept. If NACODs go on strike, the public will blame the coal board. They are not perceived as a militant union. They are not run by men like Scargill. Prime Minister, we're beginning to see our way towards a successful solution of the main dispute. I'm confident the problems with NACODs are not critically important Mr. to Mr. McGregor, listen to me very carefully. I am extremely worried about this situation. Do you understand? Do you realize that the fate of this government is at stake? Prime Minister, I... I... do not want to repeat myself again, Mr. McGregor. You have to solve this problem before it's too late. Do you understand me? Do I make myself clear? How did it go? Well, it was a pretty rough ride. I see. It seems that uh, the owners are getting twitchy. We're going to have to change tack and sort out the pit deputies as quickly as possible. How? Well, we'll have to give way on as much as we can stomach. I promise the PM as much. Hey, uh, don't ever tell a soul why we did this. Of course not. It's just you and I who are going to have to see this one through, Jimmy. Arthur Scargill has been served with a high court writ, which means that by Thursday night he could be in Pentonville prison. The court official delivered the writ while Mr Scargill was sitting with other delegates at the Labour Party conference in Blackpool. The courts are acting in the most blatantly prejudiced and political way. If you speak out against the writ, you'll be in contempt. They'll sequestrate the union funds. When will the government and the judiciary get it? You can't sequestrate an idea or a belief. Uh, that bloody woman. I mean, even the IRA can't succeed in getting rid of her. <laughs> I know. Oh, this is bad. Arthur, if you speak out, we'll lose control of the union. 
And they've got the power to imprison. Well, I don't care if I have to go to prison, then I go to prison. This is BBC One. <laughs> The High Court has handed down its punishment to the Miners' Union and its leader, Arthur Scargill, for their contempt of court. There is to be no jail sentence, but rather a fine of £1,000 on Mr Scargill and one of £200,000 on the NUM. Margaret's furious. We've only got nine days left before the NACOD strike and talks between them and the board are not going well. Peter, there are some in the Cabinet who think that you should get rid of McGregor. Find someone else. Tempting, but we'd be playing straight into Scargill's hands. He'd say that getting rid of McGregor proved he'd been right all along and that the coal board's at fault. Well, if you're sure, it's your show. But McGregor's got to resolve the NACOD's dispute, otherwise Scargill could win. I think NACOD's and the TUC are playing for time, trying to get terms that are acceptable to the NUM. But then Scargill will be able to claim victory. McGregor thinks Scargill will shoot down whatever NACOD's and the TUC are able to get. This document's a waste of bloody time, Peter. You haven't got anything out of the board. We haven't signed it yet. Can't you see? This effectively accepts the closure plan. But it's rubbish. The board agreed to put the five pits into the review procedure. Well, that's worthless. All they're saying is that they'll reconsider them. You should have held out for withdrawal. Now, can we keep the temperature down? Look, the coal board have settled on the issues that were of concern to our members, and they've also accepted that there needs to be an appeal stage during the pit review procedure. Well, what the hell is the use of an appeal stage if you accept the economic closure of pits? This document said there's a requirement to reflect both market and production opportunities. You've given way on the whole point of the entire dispute. We'll make your views known to our full executive when they meet to vote. These terms are worse than what they offered us in July. You've achieved absolutely nothing, and you're going to weaken our position by accepting them. In effect, Prime Minister, the Union are going to find it extremely difficult to operate. They might not even be able to get into their own headquarters. Prime Minister, the Energy Secretary is outside. Ask him in. This is excellent news, Leon. Have you heard, Peter? The High Court have finally lost patience with the NUM and sequestrated their entire assets for contempt. And there's more good news, Prime Minister. NACODs have given up on Scargill. They've cancelled their strike unconditionally. Thank <laughs> God. At last, it's becoming obvious to everyone that Scargill's demands are completely unreasonable. Mr Scargill, are you sure that your members will continue to support you? I mean, some are already returning to work. Well, you, you see, Mr Jones, there are only two options on pit closures. One, you allow them to close. Or alternatively, you fight it. If you fight it and you've lost, then at least you fought it. And if the miners really start returning to work in their droves, how far are you prepared to compromise? If I'm the last person opposing the closure plant, then that will be my position. That's the important thing. If I am right, then I'll stick there. I mean, those people who fudge or compromise, I, I, I don't know how they live with themselves. You either take a principled stance and you don't back down, or you don't take a stance at all. The coal board are offering the miners huge Christmas bonuses if they come back to work. How many have taken up the offer? Over 2,000 so far. That's after every week. After nine months, they must be starting to realise they can't win. If we can get past that magic 50% mark, get more than half of them back to work, then the miners will finally have voted with their feet. Even Scargill will have to admit the strike's finished. Ah, uh, Minister, the General Secretary of the TUC is on the line. Interesting. Thank you. Mr Willis, how can I help? The miners' strike. It's gone on far too long. I agree. Well, the TUC want to help resolve it. Will you agree to meet a contact group, myself and six others? We'd like to put to the NUM and the coal board the idea of a return to work, followed by discussions about the industry in general. Peter, I'm not going to return to the old days where the TUC expected to be invited to number 10 for beer and sandwiches. Of course not, but I think there are advantages to meeting them. I'm not convinced. If I refuse to see them, aren't we sending out signals to the wider union movement that the government's just being 
well, pig-headed. I want no fudging on key principles. Any talks on the future of the industry must take place after a return to work. And the NUM must not be able to claim that the programme of pit closures has been withdrawn, or that there'll be no pit closures while talks continue. It must be clearly seen that the coal board is free to manage the industry. So you're happy that I set up a meeting? I suppose a rebuff might alienate moderate opinion. When would you see them? The Magnificent Seven. Sorry? Um, <clears throat> next week, in my office. In the 25 minutes here on BBC One, Starsky and Hutch put their all into solving a murder in part two of the setup. First, the nine o'clock news with Julia Somerville. <laughs> The TUC get no joy from the government over the pit strike. Murdered in Northern Ireland. Minister, I cannot overemphasize the danger of you talking with the TUC. You're playing straight into Scargill's hand. Mr. McGregor. For nine months, Scargill has been trying to get the government involved. Now, you've stepped right into it, and Scargill can run to his men and say, Don't worry, boys, it's nearly over. McGregor has been moved out of the way. The government have taken control. They're about to cave in. Victory is ours. I think you're overreacting. They can't talk to both of us. Scargill and the TUC will drive a coach and horses between us. The damage could be incalculable. With respect, the damage would have been incalculable if I, as Energy Secretary, had refused to see them. It would have mobilized other unions in Scargill's support. It's already slowing down the back-to-work movement. Why are men going to risk their necks if they think there's about to be a sellout? You could put the end of the strike back by months. We've got to get negotiations back on track. Well, read this. The board are now insisting that we sign a written promise that we'll help solve what they call uneconomic capacity even before they're prepared to get back to the negotiating table. No union in history has ever been asked to do this. It's completely outrageous. They're demanding things that they'd never even dared to mention a few weeks ago. Arthur, have you got any ideas? What can the TUC do to get talks going again? You can implement the decision passed by Congress. Yes. What's the point of Congress passing resolutions promising us support when you don't deliver? Dishonourable men, trade unionists, want to isolate Look, we've got to function, all of us, in the real world. No, I don't. No, if you've got any influence, Norm, any influence at all, try to... to is there no way you can persuade a minister or anyone else to allow the board to negotiate. We go straight to the top. Walker? No, Thatcher. Norman, I thought number 10 didn't do beer and sandwiches anymore. It's our last chance, Ray. The government's pulling the strings. If we can convince Thatcher to be reasonable, then maybe, just maybe, we can stop the miners suffering a humiliating surrender. Reasonable? We are talking about the same Prime Minister. We appreciate you seeing us, Prime Minister, at such short notice. Tea and sandwiches are on the table over there. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Why don't you start the ball rolling? Yes. Well, we all want to see this dispute settled, and, and the TUC believe that there has been a significant shift in the NUM's position. But there is a real fear within the union that by accepting in advance that the board has the right to close any pit it deems uneconomic, the union would be abandoning their right to state a contrary case. I appreciate your efforts. I too want this dispute concluded as quickly as possible. But this requires a clear resolution of the central issues. It's in no one's interest to end the strike with an unclear formula. Yes, but the And thing arguments is... about interpretation and accusations of bad faith could provide the basis for another dispute. I want to re-emphasize, Prime Minister, that we all feel that there has been a shift in the NUM's position. Well, the government has great difficulty in judging the position of the NUM, particularly when Mr. Scargill makes repeated statements about the union's unchanged position. Mr. Willis, there can be no fudging. A settlement has to be clearly based on the right of the board to manage and an acknowledgement that they will take the economic performance of pits into account when decisions about closures are made. In our view, this document is their final position. They've made it absolutely clear that no further changes are achievable. 
Well, I feel that the TUC have got real concessions out of the board and the government. They've agreed that any proposed shutdown would go through the new closure procedure. We urge you to examine this offer carefully. It's not ideal. It's tough in some... What about the sacked men? The board held out no hope for an amnesty. <sighs> some of the coal fields are suggesting a return to work without an agreement. But don't even think about it. It means absolute defeat. You won't have a negotiating leg to stand on. They're saying it's peace with honour. Heads held high. We can live to fight another day. It'll threaten all the agreements and structures you've already got in place. Arthur? We can't accept this. Oh, please, Arthur. No, it's worse than what they were offering a few weeks ago. I share the TUC's disappointment that the NUM executive has rejected the proposals which had been made. <clears throat> For the executive to say that not just the TUC general secretary, but people like Ray Buckton and Moss Evans went back with a document which was worse than what they were offered previously is a total criticism of those trade union leaders. Yeah. 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 Dr. David Owen. Does the Secretary of State agree that there is a strong likelihood that the strike will come to an end more quickly if there is a pause in negotiations? Yeah. Yeah. The board has said that until Mr. Scargill confirmed that he was willing to accept the reality that uneconomic pits must face the prospect of closure, there was no point in having further negotiations. Yeah. I believe that many miners have remained out because of a strong loyalty to the Union. I hope that they now recognize, particularly after the events of this week, that that loyalty should not apply only to the present leadership of their Union. Yeah. Prime Minister, the number of miners going to work this morning was 50.75% of the total workforce. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much. Scargill's called a meeting of his national executive. Arthur, have you given any thought as to what you'll be recommending tomorrow? Yeah, and we were let down by the Labour movement, Peter. To their eternal shame. The National Executive. Tomorrow. Well, I've only got a casting vote. It'll be tight. Maybe evenly split. You might have to use your vote. Will you recommend a return to work? I'm not going to vote. Miners' delegates from every coal field in Britain are meeting at the TUC in London at the moment to decide whether or not to call off the strike. Many delegates are in favour of an organised return to work this week, but others want to stay out until men sacked during the dispute are reinstated. As they arrived, some officials got a noisy reception from miners demanding there should be no sellout. <laughs> Mr. President, I think that what the National Executive have done this morning is a complete abrogation of their responsibility. <laughs> to those boys who have fought for 12 months, they should have their guts to make a recommendation to the conference. It's no good trying to get off the hook. We have been on the hook for the last 12 months, Chairman, and it's no good looking for scapegoats. Look, look, I want to make it absolutely clear. No one on the National Executive is looking for a scapegoat. <laughs> Conference, <clears throat> what stands before us is whether the men who have given so much loyalty, who have stood fast during this dispute, whether they return to work with leadership or whether they return to work in chaos. The one thing that has become obvious to all of us is that the drift back to work is such that we are losing control of the situation. Prime Minister, the conference have sent the executive out again. They're trying to force them to make a recommendation. Well, we'll know soon enough. The latest figures for the cost of the strike so far? Yes. Still a rough estimate, of course, but with the burning of extra oil, losses in coal production, extra policing, steel and rail losses, uncollected taxes, the figures in the region of £3.4 billion. It's a huge sum. But it was necessary. It's money well spent. I have 
to tell conference that we, the executive, have failed to agree. Which means we're in exactly the same position as we were at the start of conference. Therefore, it must be a matter now for conference to determine policy. I want to call upon the representative of South Wales to present their motion. Conference. In view of the fact that there has been a drift back of members to work and that it has become clear that the coal board have no intention of negotiating with the union unless we sign the document presented by the TUC, we resolve that the union now organise and authorise a return to work of our members that are still on strike and that this return should commence on Tuesday, the 5th of March, 1985, without any signed agreement. People talk about going back with our heads held high. We are not going back with our heads held high. We're going back because we're being forced back and we're being starved back. We are going back because we cannot hold our members out any longer. We have reached a position where our members just cannot take any more. Comrades, the men are calling for leadership. And you have two alternatives. You either give them that leadership and repay the loyalty they have given us, or you sit back with your blindfolds on and let the strike collapse around you. That's not leadership. We have to live in the world as it is, not as we would like it to be. And I am asking this conference now, save the National Union of Mine Workers for Christ's sake and support the motion. It appears that the National Coal Board, at the insistence of the government, is not prepared to negotiate. And the Special Representatives Conference of the National Union of Miners has voted to suspend strike action forthwith. We can't go back! I think I want to say this. We have been involved in the greatest industrial struggle ever seen. I want to say to each and every one of you, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. People will, look at this, people will look at this struggle and try to pick out what advances have been made. And to do that would be to miss the point. The greatest achievement is to struggle itself. Our struggle will inspire workers throughout the world. They will have a completely new outlook as far as the fight for jobs is concerned. We've given you our blood, we've given you everything, and then you sell us out while you're tarred and feathered with the rest of the scabby bastards. Yeah! Neil, Scalga's making an announcement outside the TUC. Quick, turn it on. Scalga's just standing there. He looks absolutely devastated. <sighs> Madness. Madness. I want to thank those miners who stayed at work, the dockers who stayed at work, the lorry drivers and the managers. These were the people who kept the wheels of Britain turning. <laughs> what are your personal feelings now the strike's over? It is one of overwhelming relief. I am overwhelmingly thankful it is all over. Yet now it is over, what I want to see, what we all want to see now, is a prosperous and successful coal industry. Thank you very much. The longest strike in British industrial history ended on the 5th of March, 1985 when, for the first time in 12 months, all 175,000 miners went back to work in Britain's 169 pits. Five years later, 
there were 65,000 miners working in 73 pits. In 2004, there are 12 pits employing just 6,000 miners. In the duel by Michael Samuels, the Prime Minister was played by Patricia Hodge and Arthur Scargill by David Throffel. Peter Walker, MP, was played by Adam Godley, Nicholas Ridley, MP, by Michael Cochran, Leon Britton, MP, by Jonathan Coy, Norman Tebbit, MP, by Paul Murray, and Stephen Dorrell, MP, by David Holt. Peter Heathfield was played by Keith Drinkle, Mick McGarkey by John McGlynn, Terry Thomas by Sean Probert, Billy Etherington by Stuart Howson, Peter McNestry by Decker Wormsley, and Scargill's secretary by Mir Sotirio. Neil Kinnock MP was played by Owen Teal, Michael Foote MP by Patrick Godfrey, Stan Orme MP by Ian Flintoff, Norman Willis by Trevor Cooper, Gavin Laird by Murray Ewan, and Ray Buckton by Chris McDonnell. Ian McGregor was played by Ed Bishop, and Jimmy Cowan by David Ashton. Michael Samuels' The Duel was produced in Bristol by Jeremy Howe and Isabel Eaton.